Most SpongeBob fans are likely familiar with Revenge of the Flying Dutchman. It was one of the first SpongeBob games for a home console and the first to play out in a 3D platformer format. Reviews for it were mixed, to say the least. It did manage to win a Kid's Choice Award for Favorite Video Game in 2003, though. The biggest issue most people have in retrospect is the glitch in the PS2 version that causes everything to freeze when moving to another area. When we looked at that version in our last video, it actually happened to me and left me in a position where I needed to start the whole game all over again. Very close to the end, nonetheless. But one version that isn't talked about as much is the one for the Game Boy Advance, which actually came out first. This was developed by Vicarious Visions, the same people who made Legend of the Lost Spatula. They made most of the SpongeBob Game Boy games before WayForward Technologies took over with the movie. Now, I don't usually look at other reviews before playing a game for myself, since I like for my opinions to be fresh and unbiased, but I heard some very opposing opinions on this one before checking it out. Some people say it's just as good, if not better, than the console version, and others say it's absolutely terrible. But looking up reviews for it, it looks like it's received glowing praise from critics. Not even Battle for Bikini Bottom got this good of reviews. I always thought gaming critics were unnecessarily harsh on Spongebob games, so it's very rare to see one so positively received. When we looked at Vicarious Vision's Legend of the Lost Spatula, the biggest issue I had was that certain parts were extremely hard. Also, the inconvenient inventory system. So let's see how they handled this adaptation. <laughs> Right away, we can see the plot is a little different from the console rendition. SpongeBob is out walking Gary in Jellyfish Fields, but Gary smells kelpnip and runs off to find it. Shouldn't it be snail nip? Kelpnip infers that it's nip for kelp. So now you have to chase him. We then see that we move throughout the game by choosing a stage from a select screen. We only have home sweet pineapple right now, so let's check it out. You go around collecting doubloons and blowing bubbles. If you collect all the doubloons in one stage, you unlock an extra ending you can choose after the final boss. So you collect different bubbles to perform different abilities, and right now you can use them to trap jellyfish and use them as platforms. They hurt you if they touch you before you can. You can take five hits before you lose a life, which is way more generous than the system in Legend of the Lost Spatula. You can also find characters from the show walking around. Patrick's out jellyfishing and Squidward's just looking for a place to play his clarinet in peace. The first stage is really simple, but we get a good taste of what to expect when we get to the bounce bubbles. Rather than trapping jellyfish, these bubbles let you bounce on them. You can even blow more in the air to bounce even higher, but they burst pretty quickly, so you better be quick about it. Then you find strong bubbles that can break through barriers and kill enemies, as well as float bubbles that can carry you up into the sky. This is a good tutorial that shows you how everything is going to work without being too difficult. You can get a sense for how the rest of the game will play out. So once you find Gary, you also find a treasure chest, but no kelp nip in sight. What will the kelp eat now? But there's a nice similarity with the console version where a bunch of smaller chests come out of the bigger one until you reach the bottle. Then the Flying Dutchman comes out, and he's a lot nicer in this version. SpongeBob thinks he's a genie and wants him to grant a wish. He's so insistent about getting this wish that the Dutchman says he'll grant him one if he helps him find all of his lost treasures. Obviously, he isn't seeking revenge this time, so the title is a bit of a misnomer but he does kind of do something at the end. So now you learn the purpose of most of the stages. You have to collect three keys to unlock a chest, which contains one of the Dutchman's treasures. You also learn cool mechanics like the ability to hide in square-shaped crevices to avoid enemies. You can also crawl through crawl spaces and inflate yourself to fly across chasms. So we can assume we'll have to do a lot in order to find some of these keys. After you find the first treasure, the Medal of Dishonor, you can do this bonus stage where you replicate a jellyfish's dance moves like in the episode Jellyfish Jam. The more rounds you complete, the more extra lives you get. This is a really good feature and one fans of the show will enjoy seeing. Now we can choose from three new stages to decide where we go next. Let's just go to the right. In Walking the Plankton, Spongebob heads to the Krusty Krab and receives an order to deliver to Rock Bottom. So nice of the Krusty Krab to deliver all the way out there. Imagine you work in Chicago and someone calls you an Elgin asking for a delivery. I imagine the food would be cold by then. But who am I kidding? Mr. Krabs would probably send Spongebob to the Mariana Trench if someone offered to pay. Also, you're delivering Krabby Patty Pie. Let's just hope it wasn't made in a bomb factory. Now you actually get to start the next stage by jumping into Rock Bottom. Now that's awesome. Wow, I showed up in a new city and immediately shot someone. I'm an absolute menace. The newer enemies can be tougher than the jellyfish, but a bubble should keep them back. This is the first stage that might be a little confusing to navigate. 
You might spend time going in the completely wrong direction, like with this jellyfish obstacle, only to find out it was just for a doubloon chest. But if you explore a level enough, you might find these bonus stages lying around. You ride a jellyfish around a rodeo, collecting coins and avoiding obstacles. This is cool to shake up the game, but you might be a little disappointed if you go out of your way to find a key and end up finding one of these instead. The next stage is called Urchin to Fight. <sighs> Plankton shows up because all he wants is Krabby Patty, but Mr. Krab sends him away. He then sends you to deliver a Krusty Krab pizza. It is the pizza for you and me, after all. You're delivering it to the Outback because I guess they're getting sick of steakhouses. <laughs> This stage has some pretty scary monsters that come out of caves and eat you. Also quicksand that you can sorta jump through. You're delivering to this kid who looks like he used to possess four biscuits before consuming the first. He even references that. This stage can be tough to navigate, but rewarding to figure out. Then comes trouble. We get what's called a special challenge, and unlike special stages in most games, you're required to beat this if you want to continue. Plankton is grabbing Krabby Patties with his flying mechanisms and you have to shoot bubbles to stop them. If they even grab one, it's game over. What I don't like is that all the stages like this are timed, but they don't stop going even after you lose. If I can't win, why not just let me start over right away? But what's new is that Mr. Krabs gives you special boots that you can select to run faster and jump higher. I wonder if they squeak. Once you beat the challenge, you have to deliver Krabby Patty Chili through a snowstorm. Sorry, Mr. Krabs, but you won't be competing with the Chum Buckets Chili Pie anytime soon. This stage also has icy platforms you can slip off of. Then you land in a different area and have to make your way back to the top. Eventually, you meet Squidward and you have to annoy him by repeatedly talking to him until he plays his clarinet and causes a platform to fall for you. Hey, this game didn't annoy Squidward mission before Battle for Bikini Bottom. This stage can be fun to figure out, but you better prepare yourself for what comes next. We're thrown into a boss fight against Plankton, and oh boy, it's kind of a mess. He shoots a claw at you, but detracts it if you hit it with a bubble. You might think you're damaging him, but only after the fight goes on for way too long will you realize that's not what you're supposed to do. You have to hit him in the eye with a bubble to damage him. The whole time, he's shooting these three-way lasers at you. They must have been in a choir because they have ridiculous range. I could be all the way in St. Kitts and Nevis and one would still hit me. It's hard to tell what their range is because they still manage to constantly hit me even when I feel I'm far enough away. Not to mention it's hard to hit his eye because he keeps blocking your shots with his claw, but if you get too close, you take damage from the claw. He also takes a few too many hits to go down, but once he does, it isn't over. You'll have probably lost a ton of lives by now, but he actually moves into a second form that shoots lasers from above. You don't get any extra lives, and if you lose, you start from the very beginning of the first form. This is a little excessive. But once you beat him, you're done with the Krusty Krab for good. Forever. I quit. So let's head to Out and About, which is represented by Sandy's Tree Dome. You start at Muscle Beach and jump across umbrellas and lifeguard towers. You also jump across sea monsters. Hey, those are fellow sea creatures, be nice to them. As far as the design goes, I really like this stage. There's so much to see here. Eventually, you meet Sandy, who invites you to her tree dome and shows off a karate move that you'll definitely get later. The most annoying enemies you'll encounter here are these scallops that fly into you. It's very hard to avoid them. But after this is a more confusing stage called Under the Boardwalk. The chest is at the very start of it, but you have to make your way through caves and enemies to reach the keys. Then we get another special challenge when you visit Sandy's tree dome. She gives you a karate glove and tasks you with hitting every single acorn as it falls from her tree. Again, even if you miss one, the stage doesn't instantly end, but you can't win unless you hit them all. You get a hilarious image if you lose, though. Missing that acorn was a deadly mistake. Once you win, you head to a carnival in the chapter called Sideshow Spongebob. No way, did they just make a reference to Sideshow Bob? That is one thing I never expected to see referenced in a Spongebob game. Anyway, this stage is wild. I like how you have to travel through the tents to find bubbles that can help you in other tents, but it's also really confusing. It's hard to tell what order you have to go in or how to find your way back once you ride the Ferris wheel to a completely different side of the park. But I like these tents because they have goofy characters in the background and you can bounce on stuff. But one tent I absolutely despise is this one. You have to bubble the jellyfish at such a specific height, then you have a limited time to jump on it and reach a crawl space before the bubble bursts. But you have to be crouching, which cuts your jump height in half. Even if you are crouching, you might still miss. Nothing in the game tells you this is what you have to do, so I was stuck on this part for a while, wondering if the controls were broken or something. 
Then immediately after it, you're met with more jellyfish, and if you die, you have to do it all over again. At least knowing is half the battle. You also have the karate glove now, and you can use it to break through small barriers. It's really handy. Get it? It goes on your hand. You get to use it in the boss fight where you take on the Alaskan bullworm. Almost as scary as Patrick's belly button. It breaks through one of four walls and shoots balls of death at you. It might take you a moment to figure out what to do, but once you do, this is one of the easier fights. You hit one of the balls and send it right back to the worm. Hit the balls to weaken the worm. Important life lesson. Now let's move on to jellyfish fields forever. Nothing to get hung about. I also really hate the look of these platforms. They make me itchy. You find Patrick out jellyfishing and just head on through the stage. Now this just feels familiar and serene. One of those levels where the risk doesn't seem too high. You're just playing through a Spongebob game and having a good time. Then we reach the jungle and havoc rains upon us. It's a fun location to travel through, but it's very easy to get lost in. We also get to annoy Squidward again. If you can navigate all the trees and jellyfish you have to jump on, you'll reach what might be the hardest special stage of them all. Patrick gives you a net to catch jellyfish with, then you have 30 seconds to jump across platforms and catch 10 of them. Again, you can't even miss one. You can't miss a single jump either. Every second counts. But it's worth it for the jellyfish net. You can use it to catch jellyfish and it's really useful. Then it's on to the hooks. Unlike in the console version, you can't ride them with your jellyfish net. Missed opportunity. But you can jump on the ones with ledge-like proportions. Then you ride them up and jump off to reach higher platforms. It's cool, but really easy to take damage in when you're traveling through a cluster of them. Then it's on to the boss fight. This is probably the easiest boss of them all. You catch the jellyfish surrounding the bigger jellyfish, then you shoot bubbles up at it while avoiding its stings. And then, at last, the final stage makes itself known. The Flying Dutchman's Ship. The Dutchman tells you that you took too long to find his treasure, so he's made all your friends part of his crew and he's going to search for more treasure now. Similar to what happens in the console variant, but a lot less disturbing in execution. Still not really a revenge, though. Unless you consider this revenge against you for taking too long. Sorry, I couldn't figure out the way through that crawl space. So now you get an exceptionally tough stage, as you might have expected. You have to jump across these platforms that spin and avoid all the enemies surrounding them. If you fall, the floor will slide you back to the start as the enemies continue to attack you. It's really hard to get the hang of, especially with the platforms spinning before you can really think about what to do next. But once you get on board the ship, try not to be killed by the steam that shoots up at you right by the entrance. That's so cruel. There are also mean old ghosts flying around. I wonder if they're obsessed with booty this time. Someone grabbed my booty! You navigate the ship and find your friends individually, bringing them back to their senses as the giant hand takes them away. This part isn't too hard, but it serves to prepare you for the final fight with the Dutchman on the deck. He glitches in and out of reality, but when he's in his physical state, you can attack him. If you're too slow, he shoots fire at you. If you hit him, he drops barrels on you. You might think it's enough to just hit him, but... Ah, <laughs> no. That's very much not the case. I know it looks like he's taking damage, but don't be like me and attack him like this non-stop, wondering why this guy just won't die already. See, when the barrels come down, you have to select your karate glove and hit one of them so it flies at him. It might still miss, but you do this until he goes down. Then he gives in and offers to grant your wish, so you can choose from a selection of wishes to determine your ending. You get a photo of whichever one you choose, and that's the end of Revenge of the Flying Dutchman. So, what do we think about this one? In my opinion, I know the console version isn't the most beloved Spongebob game in existence, but I personally wouldn't go as far as to say this is just as good or even better than it. Vicarious Visions games tend to overdo it with the difficulty, and it can really suck the fun out of some stages when you're stuck on the same obstacle for too long. But I do like how the locations are used and how you interact with the characters. It's a lot more light-hearted than the one most of us know, so some people might prefer that from a story perspective. I think some of the ways you can work around obstacles are clever, but some instances needed some more fine-tuning. A little more guidance through the more confusing stages, better indications of what you're supposed to do in some places, and in instances like the dreaded circus tent, making sure the obstacles work well with the control limitations. Neither renditions of Revenge of the Flying Dutchman are perfect, but they have their high points too. And I mean, we did get Battle for Bikini Bottom a year later, so we didn't have to wait too long for Spongebob games to skyrocket in quality. But looking at my channel, it looks like I've been hammering out the Spongebob videos lately, so I think we should do something else for the next video. But maybe we'll get to Battle for Bikini Bottom one of these days. Maybe.
But until next time, thank you for joining me. I will see you in the next memory.